Hello and greetings from Open 5G Con at Red Hat. My name is Azhar Saeed. Thank you for joining us today for this fireside chat with Shamik Mishra from Capgemini. Shamik is VP and CTO, connectivity at Capgemini. Thank you for joining us, Shamik. Hello. Hello, Azhar. Thank you very much for inviting me today. Thank you, Shamik. Uh, we have a very interesting fireside chat here today for all of you. Hopefully, you will enjoy this conversation um, between me and Shamik. So let's come to our discussion, Shamik. Let me start with the first question. You know, since you've been working as a uh, for an integrator, and also you you're also a software stack supplier and a software developer. What does 5G mean to you? Well, it's a major opportunity for us, actually, if you look at it. Uh, we work in over 11 sectors today, different industries from manufacturing to telecommunication to automotive to you know, transportation. And nearly every sector today wants to leverage 5G in some way or other. And so for us, it's a major opportunity to take our connectivity knowledge, our connectivity capabilities to all of these sectors today. And uh, based on that mm -hmm. and uh, anticipating that, we did a uh, kind of a research uh, ourselves uh, through the Capgemini Research Institute. And, uh, and we actually interviewed over 1,000 uh, executives from these different industrial organizations. And we wanted to understand from them what does 5G really mean for them. And we were quite surprised to understand that over 60% of those executives responded by saying that they are already early adopters of 5G. They are in the different level of adoption. Mm. Some of them are still in R&D mm. phase. Some of them are doing proof of concepts. So that's extremely encouraging uh, when you see that industries are, are leveraging 5G. Uh, then we are also working quite heavily with several industrial players today in trying to understand what kind of use cases they want to develop in 5G. Uh, over 40% mm -hmm. of our customers want to look at 5G as possible improvement lever for their OPEX uh, in the sense that they want to reduce, uh, reduce cost, increase more automation, get more data-driven industries uh, to be leveraged, mm -hmm. to be built. Uh, and that is giving rise to what we call as intelligent industry, which sort of, uh, uh, you know, connects in, uh, industries or data and cloud together and builds new kinds of intelligent use cases. Now, today, as we speak, we are working with the leading industrial players in developing manufacturing use cases for smart factories. Uh, we are working in connected cars. Uh, again, this is leveraging data and cloud uh, or edge, as you may want to call it. Uh, then we are working with uh, companies who want to improve overall workforce collaboration using 5G. Uh, there are companies who are looking to build uh, 5G as a major enabler for their transportation business. So yes, in, uh, uh, at a nutshell, I would say that 5G adoption is really picking up fast. Uh, we were definitely hampered by the pandemic a bit, but things are now back on track and we do see more and more industrial organization to offer new services enabled by 5G. You raise a very interesting point, Shamik. Um, working with multiple different industries, not just telecom, and looking at how 5G has an impact in terms of transportation. You mentioned you mentioned industry 4.0. Um, let's talk a little bit about the deployment in those areas. Um, what do you see as the main obstacles for these different industries to adopt 5G? And also talk to us a little bit about your viewpoint with respect to uh, differences in mature markets versus emerging markets. Are there any? Oh, yes, that's a wonderful question. So if you look at 5G today, there are certain uh, issues that we will have to navigate, particularly to the enterprise uh, networks, right? So first of all, most of the enterprise networks are at least uh, the majority of the enterprise networks today have not used 5G at all. I mean, for them, 5G is completely new. Uh, mm -hmm. So how their IT infrastructure will get integrated with their OT infrastructure is fairly new, right? And it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's completely different in certain cases, right? And then, for example, there are devices which they would have invested, which has nothing to do with 5G. So do they trash all those devices? Because that won't connect to 5G. Mm -hmm. 
or they come up with new kinds of architectures, new kind of gateway architectures, which can uh, help, uh, you know, 5G device, non 5G devices connect to the 5G network. And there are architectures, mm. as you know, there are gateway architectures there are aggregator architectures, which can do that. Uh, there are also the question of different industries having different use cases. I mean, if we look at mm -hmm. a 5G from an automotive perspective, the same use case or the same architecture will not work for a manufacturing context. The languages are different. The platforms are different. How you integrate with the, the larger OT or the operational technology ecosystem is extremely different. So these are fundamental challenges when it comes to designing 5G use cases. It just cannot be a connectivity stack. It has to be an end-to-end -end solution. It has to solve a problem, not just the connectivity itself. Apart from that, mm -hmm. the installation and management of 5G is quite complicated. I mean, IoT uh, use cases or a 5G network deployment, managing all of that, you know, it's not a Wi-Fi router. It's a, it, it takes a... It takes a bit of effort to get all of that to work together, right? And then, of course, right. um, the question comes that how do we build applications for 5G? Most of the enterprises use cloud today, right? So most of them are using yep. cloud yep. native technologies to build applications. So how does those cloud native concepts can be brought onto the 5G ecosystem? I think is a major question that needs to be solved. Uh, and that's all other differences mm -hmm. that we see. Coming to a second question about mature markets and not so mature markets, I think in the mature markets, uh, people do understand that 5G would need some kind of uh, top-down approach. I mean, what kind, what will be the application, what will be the business case, the return of investments, and, and, it, go, and it follows, right? Right. In some cases, in the, in the more uh, developing markets, we would say that the the solution is more like go for a hyperscaler, integrate everything together, and then try and see what works, right? So in a way, both, both approaches are not bad, uh, but it will depend on the adoption speed, adoption, how much we are able to accelerate the market. I think that will all depend over a period of time. Mm -hmm. Now, th this is interesting because um, what I have seen, at least in my conversations, some barriers to deployment or main obstacles for deployment as you rightly said i think it's all about you know managing a large infrastructure migrating from existing yeah. infrastructure to this new one and investment i think you mentioned that in terms of they've already invested in certain devices do they, do they just throw it away or do so is there like a tipping point in terms of when you decide you know what 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 do you do or when do you actually uh, take this is this leading all to saying, do I want to go deploy a RAN first or do you want to deploy a core first? What's what's your assessment on this? Um, where do I where do I start if I'm a provider? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, wonderful question. But you, you look in the in the wireless market, you've seen this, Azar. Uh, the innovation comes from outside the telecommunication space. Uh, mm. So if you look at at three G, uh, yeah. before three G, we had internet on our mobile phones, right? We use those Nokia Symbian phones. It was difficult to navigate. We didn't know how to consume internet. We knew we had internet on phones. We simply didn't know how to consume. Then Apple and uh, then came Android ecosystem where the apps came out, which was outside the telecommunication industry who came up with this innovation of apps. Suddenly we knew how to consume internet on our phones. That's and true. then if you see in the 4G, when more reliable internet came up, uh, new kinds of businesses came up. So now you can do mobile commerce uh, uh, because we have reliable connectivity. In India, for example, where I stay, nearly everybody uses the uniform payment interfaces. Nobody, I mean, you can actually live without cash just through a mobile con commerce. Uh, you could hail a taxi anywhere now because of a mobile commerce. All of these uh, innovations came outside the telecommunication industry. Now for mm -hmm. 5G to succeed, most operators will have to understand perhaps that the ARPU is static when it comes to consumer industry. So they will have to go for the B2B businesses. They have to go after enterprises. And then the question is a chicken and egg. So will the network come first and then the innovation or will the innovation come first and then the network? If you go back to 3G and 4G, we saw that the network came first, the innovation followed. Yep. Uh, the, the apps were created, 3G came first. Uh, the 
the Ubers of the world was created and the mobile network came first. Why should 5G be any different? So 5G, the network has to come first. So to me, the industrial organizations will have to create smaller test beds, more, you know, uh, they have to create more playgrounds for 5G and use cases will happen. Uh, so to me, the RAM, it doesn't matter whether it's RAM and core, but more importantly, at least the 5G radio network has to come in. Uh, the mm. core network from standalone versus stand non-standalone can still be evolved over a period of time. But the radio network is first. I think most industries will have to go and invest in a couple of labs at least uh, mm -hmm. to get started and to, so that their innovation engine can get energized. I think that makes a lot of sense because also if you match that uh, if, you know, with some of the trends that I've been seeing and watching, um, majority of these telcos that I've, talk, I've talked to have started to deploy RAN first, regardless of, yeah. and, and that's the radio infrastructure. Right, essentially, Indeed. Uh, because you want to get into the, uh, you know, you want to take the advantages of new frequency bands, you want to take the advantages of new new radio technology, and at least get your feet wet, as you said, um, you know, uh, yeah. create some labs, create some infrastructure, create some pilots, and get your feet wet, right? Um, so uh, this raises an interesting question for me. Let's just dig a little bit deeper into this, into in terms of the RAN, in terms of the core conversation. Um, does cloud play a role in this? Um, and if so, what is that role? Uh, or what is the impact of cloud and cloud and virtualization in terms of deployment of RAN and then deployment of core? Oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, let's look. I mean, uh, you know it, Azar, better than me, that for the past 10 years, since 2013, we have been trying to virtualize the network right we have seen a lot of mm -hmm. virtualization efforts going in the the emergence of nfv and everything there but still it was uh, for a mobile network operator that was targeting what could be say 30 percent of the network grid. i mean 70 percent of the network is radio network which has not been virtualized at least for majority of the operators mm -hmm. so the actual benefit of virtualization when it comes to you know lower costs of ownership or better innovation models completely missed uh, the RAN uh, ecosystem. So if we have to get into a cloud and actually benefit from the overall uh, overall economies of scale of cloud, uh, RAN cannot be left out. Uh, so virtual mm -hmm. RAN is here, in my opinion, is going to address the elephant in the room, how to reduce costs for RAN. Secondly, mm -hmm. it would also open up more innovation on the radio network side. If you look, the mm -hmm. radio network in, uh, innovation has primarily been centered around two things, uh, the spectrum, the radio network itself, uh, the overall, you know, uh, overall in new features getting added, carrier aggregation and stuff like that. But when it comes to building use cases on top of the radio network, so how can you improve the quality of experience? Uh, how mm -hmm. can you create uh, better spectral efficiencies for the, for the deployment? Uh, how can we leverage, you know, uh, indoor connectivity better? Uh, how do we make indoor connectivity better? All of these use cases completely uh, were not really mainstream prior to 5G. And it is was primarily because the RAN was closed. Uh, we'd have mm. no ways of configuring the RAN or getting telemetry out of RAN. RAN mm. was not virtualized, so it was a single vendor ecosystem mostly. So to me, the RAN virtualization is uh, is most important element here, and the radio intelligent controller of ORAN, and and coming to ORAN, the ORAN and uh, the ORAN ecosystem itself is uh, is driving a lot of such innovation. Now that's one part of the cloud. The other part of the cloud is the edge. Uh, now edge mm -hmm. to me is small little clouds everywhere, right? It's like having uh, mini clouds all over the geographies, and you are able to run any mm -hmm. kind of uh, applications on top of it, right? This is just the extension of what the virtualization uh, be benefits that we had already derived out of the core. That has to be extended to cloud, but there's one significant difference in edge. That is the applications. The applications mm -hmm. are going to be cloud native. These applications are built by developers who don't understand 5G network. You don't expect an augmented reality application to understand what is a radio bearer. Uh, mm. You don't expect an, uh, a gaming application developer to, you know, to know what how 5G core network works. 
So adopting cloud in its true form, that is cloud native application developer experience is absolutely imperative if the operators need wants to make money out of edge and i think that's the major change the two major change to me is the virtualization of the ran and the application developer developer experience on the edge i think these are the two major things which to me uh, is is changing the ecosystem how no, i think, it think makes, about it i think it makes a lot of sense i think you brought up a couple of very good points one is innovation is driven through disaggregation and when you start to open up the ran then you provide opportunities to more people to add value. So that's Absolutely. one I think, very important point that you brought up. The second point that you brought up was, hey, it's not just about connectivity, it's about applications because that's what drives those services. And to host those applications along with the software, that's what do you need? You need a cloud platform underneath. So virtualization becomes incredibly important to open it up, which is disaggregation component of it. And then you need the platform to run those applications. So very, very well said, Shamik, uh, on that. So, uh, but you brought up during that conversation two interesting topics that piqued my interest. So let me just dive into those. First one, you mentioned something about ORAN. Um, we know that there is an interesting conversation in the industry around ORAN, Open RAN, uh, and then ORAN Alliance is trying to do some things in terms of standardization of those open interfaces, etc. What's your assessment? Do you believe it is truly open with ORAN or do you believe there is still more to be done in that space? I think it's work in progress. It's a work in progress. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the fundamental thing about ORAN is that what we are trying to achieve out of ORAN is uh, the more ability or the flexibility to manage the network better. So mm. for that, in order to do that, we need three things. First, uh, majority part of the radio network has to be running on a cloud native architecture uh, right. so that it's scalable it is agile you can change software easily you can run the uh, the industry tested models like devops and uh, stuff like that on top of a radio network workload i know it's easier said than done but that's the goal so that's mm -hmm. the first part the platform itself now that introduces other challenges that how do you do hardware acceleration? How do you get an FPGA to work? Because radio network are time sensitive networks and things like that. That's a separate yep. problem to solve. The, the second part of uh, the model is that if you have to disaggregate the hardware and the software, then you need to open up the interfaces. So you yep. have to define APIs. Now APIs have to be standardized because you cannot possibly have uh, you know, a bunch of vendors uh, developing one set of APIs and another set of vendors building another set of APIs. So you need to at least standardize those APIs. And that's where I think ORAN Alliance is doing a good, great job. Yes, mm -hmm. it's still work in progress, but uh, that's still possible. The third one is that how do you make, um, make maximum utilize or how do you utilize this overall um, open ecosystem? For that, mm -hmm. you need controllers, you need better orchestrators, you need to develop, you need to collect data from the RAN itself and then leverage the data to build new use cases. That's where the, uh, the whole idea of, you know, X apps, as they call it in, in ORAN, mm. uh, building new applications just on the RAN itself. So now if you look at this, there's three layers, the, the, the hardware, the cloud native platform, the workloads and the orchestration. All of this is a platform. Uh, yep. At the end of the day, if you're trying to convert a radio network to a, radio, a platform to innovation, that's not easy. That's not easy. Yep. Uh, but then I don't see any other way uh, to improve the overall efficiency of the network, reduce cost in the long run. Uh, and, and, and mind it, this is not, ex not going to be inexpensive. I mean, system integration uh, with so many different vendors will be costly. But the benefits of ORAN will be realized over a period of time. And if the operators are able to commit more sites, if they commit near 80% of the network over the next five to 10 years would become open RAN, lack of a better word, virtual open RAN, then I think they will benefit from ORAN. But if it is just a, a small uh, proof of concept or a, a, you know, one site or 10 sites or 100 sites, I don't think the cost benefit would get realized, but innovation can still happen. 
you know that's actually a great point so you you're defining almost a tipping point at which mm -hmm. the economies of scale will help drive cost reduction and innovation at the same time right now what you're saying if i heard you right and you can correct me is that right now the conversation is around innovation less so on costs and economies of scale and mm -hmm. what you're saying mm -hmm. is if you move push in that direction of economies of scale, then you, your answer is going to be far better. Is that uh, correct? Absolutely. 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 I fully agree. I mean, if you look at the hyperscalers and how they became uh, such a big uh, player in the economy, it is primarily because the, you know, the, there was innovation, there was a platform for innovation, and also it provided the economies of scale, right? Now, you cannot do one thing at a time. I mean, both of the things have to happen. I know it's not mature enough today to say that everything can become oran tomorrow no it's a journey we all know that but then if, you ha if, if there if it is a journey you need to start somewhere That's right true. so you need That's to start true. and then we'll reach we'll reach the destination uh, but i don't think we can really think of a network without virtual ran at least in 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 next three to five years i would mm -hmm. be very surprised to not see virtual RAN becoming 70% of the, of the overall radio network uh, deployment footprint mm -hmm. in, say, five years from now. If, it's, if that happens, then we as technologists, we have goofed up something. <laughs> there you go. You've thrown out a good challenge. That's very interesting. <laughs> so, um, you know, again, you stated a couple of things I'm picking up from those. Um, you know, you brought up the conversation around hyperscalers. I think uh, it's a very interesting dynamic in the market to see how hyperscalers are competing and or partnering with telecom to address specific things around 5G. And 5G has become kind of the catalyst for driving this conversation. Uh, there's one conversation that comes into picture is around private 5G. The other conversations around you know, workload migration or even hosting, for example, 5G core in the hyperscaler cloud um, for a telco, like what AT&T did as an example, in terms of a public announcement that they made. Um, so your take on this whole, you know, hyperscaler getting into this mix and, uh, you know, how telcos are actually looking at that particular uh, investment. Oh, yes, absolutely. I think the it would be, uh, it would be, uh, you know, foolish to think that the network can scale uh, on its own. Uh, mm -hmm. Most operators believe that uh, that it can, but some of the operators don't believe it. The the hyperscalers would be there in some form of other in the five G network. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's start with the public network. I think the core is well suited to be in the hyperscalers without a doubt of course as long as the regulatory aspects are taken care of uh, the the overall ecosystem of applications uh, for the edge compute mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, the chosen platform for application developers globally is cloud native platforms on hyperscalers now whether they use a, a red hat open shift on top of it or not it's a different matter but the the choice the the default sandbox for an application developer is a cloud. Yeah. Now there is that is where the application developer ecosystem exists. Now, if you have to build applications for a private five G network, not having a hyperscaler doesn't work. I mean, there mm -hmm. will be a hyperscaler there at least for that applications. Mm -hmm. Now, coming deeper into the network, when you go towards the radio network, I uh, I would believe that hyperscalers would have a strong role to play there as well. Now, mm. whether it's already there or not, I don't. I, I would say that we are still exploring that space uh, as of now, uh, and it also depends a lot on how much uh, the hardware and the software disaggregation is possible, and how much accelerated hardware and software disaggregation is. Is I mean, how the vendor ecosystem, how they are able to accelerate the disaggregation, is going to be very important there. Mm -hmm. Secondly, of course, uh, we would like to understand better on on what kind of new architectures hyperscalers can bring onto the table for RAN. I mean, is it going to be mm. the the model that we are already seeing in the ORAN or Open RAN ecosystem, 
or something drastically different would be proposed by the hyperscalers, which we haven't thought through yet. So edge, yes, applications, private networks, pretty much hyperscalers would be there. RAN, I think uh, we are still exploring. Now, this is interesting because uh, I think consistent also in terms of conversations that I've had with other people around edge and how hyperscalers are playing a key role in terms of driving that edge conversation. Um, this is really great and also ties back to your first point in terms of who really needs 5G in terms of private 5G conversations, especially around, you know, the manufacturing, the transportation and the industry 4.0. Um, so uh, really good. Um, before we wrap up, I think I have to ask this one question. I know you have um, had active participation in the industry around open source. And, uh, you know, there are some projects going on in the industry like XG Vela and Magma uh, for Open 5G Core. And, and you have played a role, huge role actually in developing a core stack yourselves and in partnering with Hyperscaler, um, you know. So uh, what's the role do you see of open source in this space, um, you know, how can open source accelerate or perhaps hinder, you know, the development of 5G? Very good question. So uh, the open source has been a mixed bag for telecommunications, frankly. Mm. I mean, in some cases, it has been quite successful. In some cases, I would say uh, it hasn't been. Uh, uh, so first of all, I think the cloud native ecosystem the open source has to be mainstream. It has to be mainstream for the simple reason uh, Kubernetes is an open source. Now, whether there are variants of Kubernetes, the different distributions of Kubernetes, uh, that's, uh, that's the business model. But the fundamental, the fundamental software is, is open source. And remember, if we have to reduce and uh, make more money out of 5G network, we have to empower the application developer who will build applications. We have to make money out of 5G private networks. We have to figure out a way to build use cases. These use cases are built by average application developers who are not associated with the, with the operator. So mm. the operators will have to attract application developers. And what else is the way other than open source? I don't know. I mean, the best way to attract application developers is open source. But that's the application side. Now, if you go to the core infrastructure side, I don't know yet uh, whether we can actually have a 5G core network open source project which can mm. really be the de facto standard uh, for core networks globally. Mm -hmm. uh, there are two problems with that. One, I think, is uh, who would distribute it uh, unless companies like Red Hat does it. Uh, mm -hmm. Or the other option is that uh, the operators take that software and build R&D teams to, to harden, secure, and make it ma mainstream. So somebody will have to invest. For open mm -hmm. source is not free, uh, right? You get the base stuff for free, but then you have to make it into a product. Somebody has to make it into a product. So we are looking at it as an opportunity, frankly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, from a Capgemini perspective as well. The other, I think the major uh, hindrance uh, for open source is that, uh, is it going to uh, enable innovation? I think open source enables innovation, but will it, if it is not adopted at a scale of say 70% of the operators, then people will lose interest in it. Uh, mm. And people will start to believe that this won't work, right? So the operators has a major role to play. If they have to put commitments on open source, uh, build and invest in, in labs, they have to commit that they will test open source software, they will make open source software mainstream only then companies will go and invest in open source. Uh, mm. So you know the answer, right? No, I think it makes sense. I think what you're saying is, look, platform clarification part, it's a given. The yeah. network functions part in terms of open source, operators have to make the commitment to make that happen. And I think you're absolutely spot on when you say, because we've seen projects come up and dwindle when there's not enough market momentum or you know, people, customers driving that. So who owns it, who distributes it, particularly in terms of open source network functions is really, really critical because there has to be somebody accountable for that. I would love to Absolutely. see you jump into this fray, by the way. And, you know, <laughs> it, you, it will be great to have, already we have a very good partnership with you from a platform perspective, but it would be really great to see this, uh, you know, how you drive innovation. 
But Shamik, really sincerely, Absolutely. I wanted to thank you for your time. Uh, this was an awesome conversation, in my opinion. And thank you for sharing your thoughts. Thank you for sharing that opinion and providing our you know, viewers and listeners a perspective on what Capgemini is doing and how they are really shaping this, this market and what the interests are in terms of mutually uh, beneficial to both of us, to Red Hat and to Capgemini, in terms of how we take about this 5G market. So really Absolutely. appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Azar, for having me. It was a pleasure talking to you. I've known you over the over decades now. It's always absolute pleasure talking to you, Azar. Thank you so much, Amik. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. There you go. A, a wonderful fireside chat with uh, Shamik Mishra. I hope you liked it. Please uh, make sure you attend other sessions of Open 5G Con, and uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.